Your glasses, I just started wearing them a few years ago because I got older. It makes it really hard to do microscopy. But that's why I wear the thing around my neck because I'm on, off, on, off, on, off all day. Uh, I work in the Department of Ophthalmology, which is eye research, right? So all our, I don't know, you, you probably know ophthalmologists here, but in America, do you ever notice, well, obviously you haven't been there, so you wouldn't know, but all the ophthalmologists in our department, they all wear glasses. None of them wear contacts. Think about that, maybe, I don't know. I think it's because we see, we see what goes wrong occasionally. Okay, so I looked over this this morning. I got up. I took a walk around here. It's very pretty in the morning here. Just, oh, really nice. I can see why there's so many people out walking and exercising because it gets so hot. So I could see why. I was up like at, I don't know, 5 o'clock this morning walking. It was really pretty. So I went over my talk for today, and I started thinking about it. It's like, it's okay. But... I was thinking I should probably do what I do in my lab when people come to my lab to work with me, which makes more sense. So, okay, it's what you take with your phone, right? That's a digital image. Well, really, if you want to break it down, a digital image is really math, okay? And like I told you yesterday, math's not my favorite thing, but it is what it is. Okay, so now we're gonna go over to the whiteboard here. Oh, up here. Okay. So yesterday they were talking about, Dr. Senior was talking about, like in your phone you have a camera chip, okay? And it's so many what? Megapixels, right? So if we look at the chip of a camera, okay? Can everybody see that? Everybody sees it? Okay. Okay. Can we put it in the middle? Like that? Go this way? So we can see over this part of it? Okay. Okay, so your camera chip is divided into many, many pixels, right? Right? So each one of these squares represents a pixel. Okay. So the way a digital image works is photons of light come in, you have a chip, okay, oh, I got the clicker, okay, let's see, pixels, right, and it's, this is basically a schematic of the chip. So what happens is photons of light, different energies, different wavelengths, whatever, come in and hit these pixels, okay? And then the way a digital image works, whoops, let's go back one. Okay, you have different kinds of CCD chips, like different phones have different ones. The scientific cameras we use have different chips. But in general, they're all like this. They're all basically just a bunch of pixels, okay? Depending on how many pixels you have. My particular camera that I work with all the time has 1,040 by 1,392 pixels, okay? And so that's about a million pixels. Your cameras are five megapixel, eight megapixel, whatever, they're more. But we'll talk about why my camera costs $14,000 and your phone obviously doesn't cost $14,000, especially the camera in it, right? Okay, so light comes in, hits a given pixel. And I said, all this is math. So if no light hits a pixel, it's assigned the number zero. The more light that hits it, we get different numbers. So we might get 63, we might get 526, we might get 1,291, okay? Depending on how much energy, photon energy hits it, it gets assigned a numerical value, okay? So this is the basics of how a digital image works. So every pixel on a digital image has a different value usually, okay? So when digital cameras first came out, we worked in something called 8-bit, okay? Now what 8-bit means is this. 2 to the 8th. Anybody know what that is? Like what 2 to the 8th is? 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. It ends up being 256, okay? 
So when digital cameras first came out, we worked in something called 8-bit. And what that meant is the values on this chip could only go between 0 and 256. Okay? That was the first set of cameras that came out. Okay? Next, another set of cameras came out that were 12-bit. Okay? 4,096. Okay. So with the 12-bit camera, you have more. These are called gray levels. Okay. You can see more intensity detail. The camera can pull out more information out of your image because now you have this many gray levels to work with as opposed to this many gray levels to work with. Okay. This range here, this is called the dynamic range of the camera dynamic range. Okay. If you want to publish in modern biology, if you want to publish something quantitative, you need to work in 12-bit. If you work in 8-bit, you send this to a publication, to a journal, they'll go, uh-uh, it's not going to work. You need to at least work in 12-bit. Okay? All your data will have numbers in this value because it it just allows more information. You could pull out more detail. Okay, I used to sell a camera years ago when I was in sales that was 16-bit. Okay, a 16-bit camera has 65,000 some gray levels. Okay, it had industrial applications. It could show the difference in intensity. 65,000 variations of intensity. So it had so much sensitivity and intensity. We would use this camera to take a picture of like a, a painted wall, okay? And to us, it just looks like a painted wall. If you took a picture with this camera, it would look just like a painted wall. With this camera, you can see how the sprayer sprayed the wall. You can see the individual spray pattern because you had this much dynamic range to work with, okay? Okay, so anytime you decide you want to do intensity in microscopy, Make sure you're working at least at 12-bit, okay? So that's sort of the take-home message of that, okay? The other thing is, is when you work with images, you're going to save them, correct? Okay, always, 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 like a rule. You always want to save your images as TIFF, okay? So a normal TIFF image that I take on my microscope is probably about three megabytes. Okay. If I take that exact same image and I turn it into a JPEG, you've all heard of JPEG? JPEG, which is your phone produces a JPEG. The picture will look exactly the same. A TIFF and a JPEG, if you just look at them, they'll look exactly the same. But a JPEG for something like this is maybe only 27 kilobytes. Okay, it's much smaller. It loses all this extra information. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're using a picture to put into PowerPoint to show somebody or if you're using it to send in an email, that's fine. But if you're trying to do science on it, you've got to work with TIFFs. And if you want to measure something in science, you need to use a 12-bit camera and save all your images as TIFFs. Okay? So we're going to talk here a little bit about just some other things with the digital camera, and I'll use the whiteboard a little bit too. Okay. Okay. So the chips we use, we're going to talk about today, are called CCD. Okay, charge coupled device cameras, and basically what it is, it's just a bunch of silicon and such that the light hits. The photons, again, like we said, math, but the physicalness of it basically is the light hits hits this device, and they get changed into electrons, okay? There's two different flavors. There's what we call front and back. Front and back thinned, okay? These are for, you know, most normal labs, most normal applications in biology, whatever. These kind of cameras are called back thinned. So they actually take the chip and they actually edge the back, like they, they use chemicals and lasers and stuff, and they take the back off the camera, and they make it really, really thin. These are very, very sensitive cameras and very, very expensive cameras because they will break, I don't know how many chips to make one of these chips like this, okay? So it's just an expensive undertaking, but these are way more sensitive, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, 
why they're more sensitive, how they're more sensitive. They're just better and faster cameras. Okay, so basically, I think Dr. Sinner talked on this a little bit yesterday about how it's all like buckets. So when you think of this here, you're just spilling water in buckets, photons in these pixel buckets, right? Which is represented here. So the way it works is basically you fill up the pixels and then it takes a line of pixels, it changes to electrons, it dumps it out to the camera, and it generates the numbers, okay? And it happens super fast. We don't even realize it's happening. So the one thing about the bit depth, if we look at these numbers, if I had, say, a 12-bit camera, and I dumped 4,096 value in this one, I can't dump another little bit of energy in there. Because if I dumped any more energy in there, I would fill my bucket, right? My bucket would be totally full. Well, what happens when you fill a bucket over the top? What happens? It spills. So what would happen here is it would spill over to here, 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 and it would make like a big blob on the image, okay? That's what we call saturation. We have saturated the system. It cannot hold any more pixels, or it cannot hold any more photons, okay? That's bad sometimes, but sometimes it's not bad. Okay, we have metamorph. I'll show you some of this stuff too. But the reason this is bad is because, okay, if I've overwhelmed the system here, I can't measure anymore. I don't know how many, you know, there might be 8,000, but I can't measure it because I've overwhelmed the system. So I've exceeded the buckets. I've filled the buckets too high. Okay, but if I have a million pixels, okay, I have a million pixels to work with. If I have two or three pixels, or maybe five pixels that, that saturate, there's something that tells me. That tells me then that I've used the full dynamic range of the camera because I've used enough light to have a few pixels go all the way. So I know I've used this range. Okay, and this is what you're after. And we get metamorph out, I'll show you some more of this. I just want to sort of introduce it right now. But when I actually pull up images of metamorph, it'll make more sense, okay? Okay, so again, just different ways. It dumps the pixels out. Okay, uh, this is actually looking at like a, whoops. I got a clicker finger today. Okay, so basically here is just what it actually looks like physically, the chip, okay, at the more of a microscope level. But again, it's just photons being changed into electrons, producing a number. That's really all digital camera is. These are different kinds of designs, different ways the cameras are designed. Okay, and it's showing the electrons getting pushed out. Okay, so here's another important fundamental thing. Quantum efficiency, okay? So when you buy a camera, you buy a digital camera, the one thing you wanna look at is you wanna look at quantum efficiency. Okay, and what quantum efficiency is basically says, if we look at the spectrum of light, Roy G. Biv, what percentage of that light will it actually capture, okay? So basically it's the ability of the CCD to convert photons to electrons at a given wavelength. Okay, usually reported as a percentage and it varies with wavelength. So here's a typical CCD curve, or a typical quantum efficiency curve, a QE curve, right here. Okay, so what this means, if we look at one of these low curves, so it like around 500, 512. Like today we'll talk about a dye called Alexa 488. It tends to emit around 512 nanometers of light. So right around there, this camera, this particular camera, has a quantum efficiency of about, oh, what would you say? Maybe just shy of 40%, right? So that means all the light you put in, it'll grab about 40% of it, the other 60 some percent will be lost. Okay, but if we had this camera here at that same number, about 512 we go up, we would get 80 some percent quantum efficiency. It's a much more sensitive camera. It's a much better camera. This would be probably a back thin camera like I talked about a little bit ago. Okay, camera like this, eight, 10, $12,000, know, maybe $15,000. These, these are $40,000 cameras with these chips that are made to be so efficient. Because as we saw in his talk yesterday, 
Remember that talk where he had this big, it looks sort of like a bunch of squares, and he's saying it was the Golgi apparatus, things going in and out? Well, he was using a camera, probably like this, because he was trying to detect this very, very little level of fluorescence. And he wanted to go very, very fast. So he had to get as much of the photons. He couldn't waste photons. He had to grab every photon he could grab, because there were so few being made that he needed a camera that could bring all the photons in. Okay. So depending on the application, when I was in imaging sales, I sold digital cameras. The question always was, do you want to go fast? You know, what's your application? Do you need to get a lot of light in? Or do you just, you know, doing basic laboratory stuff? Okay. This kind of stuff here is more specialized techniques, whereas here's the more normal stuff. Okay, my cameras basically fall like prime between these two. Because I don't do anything that crazy. If I do, I have to go find another camera to work with. Okay. So Normal general lab stuff, you can work down to the lower quantum efficiencies. But keep in mind, there is always these extra quantum efficiencies. Okay. okay, linearity. This is where the chip in your camera and the chip in my camera become totally different. Okay, so you could actually have almost the same chip in your camera that I have in a scientific camera. The idea of linearity, though, is with increased illumination. So the more photons we're putting in, the more photons we're putting in, the more photons we're putting in, we get a linear relationship to what is actually produced number-wise. Okay? So every time I put in, say, 30 photons, I will always get this number back out. Okay? Now, if I had a curve that was all over the place, like this, then this relationship would fall apart, correct? You couldn't quantify. So what they do when they make these digital cameras for science, they go through the chips one by one. They find chips that have no bad pixels. Okay, so they're looking at a million pixels. They make sure all of them work. Because your phone, I mean, you might not notice, but there's some bad pixels there. But you don't notice because there's so many. So they make sure all of them work. And then they make sure that the chip is specced so it falls within a half percent of this linear line. Because again, like we talked about yesterday, these scientific cameras are detectors. They are made to detect, not just to take a pretty picture. Okay? So if you don't have a camera that has this linear relationship, then it isn't going to work for science. So that's why you pay the... $10,000, $12,000 for these cameras. I mean, there's other things that work too, but the heart of it is having a chip that's linear. Okay. okay. Like I said, ideally, if you have a ton of money, you want to get a camera with a high quantum efficiency that can work across a wide spectrum. Okay. Low dark current just has to do with noise. We're not going to get into that. And again, you want sufficient resolution. You need enough pixels to work with. Most of the time, a million pixel camera is fine for all the scientific imaging you'll do. Okay? It doesn't sound as good, but remember, it's a detector, not just a camera. Okay. Pixels, obviously. Okay. Now, the rest of this is just the idea of looking at this idea of gray skills. A two-bit image would look like this with only two channels, two to the first power, right? A four-bit image, you'd see a little more of the detail. Right? A one, two, three, four, four bit image, you see even more of the detail. And if we get into an eight bit, we see what we probably consider a normal picture. So you see, as you go up in bit depth, you get more resolution out of the picture. Okay? And then if we go all the way up to 12 bit, you won't actually maybe see with your eyes the difference in the quality of the picture. But when you start doing image analysis, it becomes very apparent. Okay, so does this make sense, the idea of the bit depth? Okay, because when I started selling digital cameras, I had never even heard of this technique or uh, this whole concept of bit depth. So they had to sit me down and really train me to talk, you know, to, to understand it because I was now selling digital cameras for a living. So I didn't understand any of this. But I think if you look at these pictures, it sort of shows you as you increase bit depth, you get more information out. Okay, and again, Scientific now, you've got to be at least at 12. Okay. Okay. 
Whoops. OK, again, modern biology, 12-bit. OK, why? Now, in your packet also, on your uh, drives, I included a, uh, like a four-page handout from a company called Roper Scientific. It's a real good uh, digital camera company. So take a look at that if you're interested in this, and it'll explain it a little more in detail. It's a pretty well-written article. Okay, so why do you have to use a 12-bit camera? Well, like I just said, if you want to publish. If you don't, you go send this article in to a journal, they'll go, uh-uh, this, this is not acceptable. Okay, and again, TIFFs, always. Because you need to measure brightness. Because you need to see the subtle changes in brightness. And maybe not to your eye subtle changes, but in terms of analysis, we'll talk a little bit about. And again, do you need to see this change in dynamic range? the ability to, you know, look across this dynamic range. Okay, so the thing to keep in mind when you use a camera, like I was telling you yesterday, everything's a trade-off. If you want to go fast on a camera, and yesterday was the perfect example. You saw those pictures from Dr. Sinai. They weren't pretty pictures, but they had very low resolution, but they had very high speed because he was looking at milliseconds there. So if you want to go fast, you're going to lose resolution. And if you want to go fast, you're going to lose some sensitivity. So all three of these kind of things play on each other to, to produce an image. So my advice to you is if you start a lab and you, know, you have some, I don't know, your main techniques, whatever, make sure you talk with the, the salesman to say, hey, this is really what I need in terms of a camera, OK? Because I'm trying to do this. And they can steer you in the right direction. And like I said, always feel free to email me too, and I'll give you my advice too. But all cameras are not created equal, and it's not all about a pretty picture. Okay. So when we get into Metamorph a little bit later today, what I'll be talking about, you'll see a screen like this. And what you'll see is that the most important thing is anywhere I put the cursor, you'll get a pixel value out one of these numbers. And once we start talking about image analysis, you'll understand that the most important thing on the entire metamorph screen will be this right here, the value of any given pixel. OK. okay. So remember, the image is just photons hitting a chip. It's not a color, per se, image. It's just photons hitting a chip. And today we'll talk about fluorescence. And only certain photons are allowed to get through to hit the chip, and that's why we sort of associate with color. But it's just photons hitting a chip. Man, I'm hitting, hitting, hitting. So they really have no inherent color. They're photons. So basically, every single one of these pictures here is the exact same picture. I just applied a different, what we call lookup table, color lookup table, to show it. Because in reality, it's just photons hitting a chip. Where it's brighter, the number's higher. Where it's darker, the number's lower. It's math. This is just a, a colored way to represent the math. So all these pictures, the colors, are all different because it really doesn't mean anything. Because in science of imaging, it's just photons hitting a chip producing numbers. Okay. So is everybody clear on this concept? Because this is like a key concept to the whole idea of how these things work. So if you're not clear on it, let me try to explain it to you a little better. We good? What do you think? OK, because it's not an easy concept to, to, to wrap your head around sometimes. OK, but again, it's not really colors. It's math. The brighter, the higher the number, the darker, the lower the number. Oh, whoops. Whoa. I'm not pressing it that much, am I? OK, so let's talk about the true kind of image, or the color image that you usually take. And he touched on this yesterday, Dr. Sinai. So if we look at this picture here, this is bone. OK? Uh, it's a, I think it's like a Mason trichrome variant stain of bone. But what this really is, the way a, a normal color camera works, it actually takes three pictures. It will actually take a red picture, a green picture, and I guess if I'm sensitive, we'll get the blue picture. OK, red, a green, a blue. 
So anytime you see something like this, a color picture, it's really a red, a green, a blue. Three pictures. The camera will literally take three pictures, shove them together to create this. Okay. There's another way to do it too. They have something called a bear mask. You don't see this much anymore. This was more of the older days where every other pixel would have a different color. So the blue photons could hit here, the green photons, the red, and you get the same kind of idea, but it's just a different way to go about it. Now, almost everything's a full frame red, a full frame green, a full frame blue. Okay, whoops. Okay. So remember, it's just a red, a green, and a blue. Now, the thing about this though, is what I usually talk, when I usually talk about color, like I'll call it true color, or I'll call it 24-bit color. And the reason I call it 24-bit color, 24-bit, is if you look at each of these channels, you're actually taking an 8-bit red, an 8-bit green, and an 8-bit blue. So 8 plus 8 plus 8 is 24, right? So a true color image is actually a red, green, and blue. It's an 8-bit, an 8-bit, and an 8-bit stuck on top of each other, okay? The implications here for science are, if you bring me a color image to do analysis on, it is much more difficult for me to work with that because every pixel would have a red value, a green value, and a blue value. So I'd have to be able to tease out those numbers from three different channels to work with it, as opposed to like a 12-bit image where it's either, you know, a number that's high or a number that's low. It's more like black and white. It's just much easier to work with. So if you're doing true quantitation, you're always going to work here. You really can't quantitate color. Whoops. Okay. Let's go back one. Okay. So... Like I said, this is just sort of a quick background on stuff. When we get the metamorph working, I think it'll make a little more sense when I can actually show you some examples of stuff. But this is sort of just a background idea of what it is. Okay? And for this part of the talk, we need to thank whoops. Always gotta thank who you gotta thank. Maria Daniels, she is the woman who was nice enough to give us the keys for the metamorph stuff. Uh, like I said, I used to work for this company. Well, I didn't really work for them, I sold their stuff. Uh, you know, and it's just nice of her to, it's nice to acknowledge her for giving us these keys to work with on her course this week. And, uh, and the last, basically the last one was just thanking uh, Simon Watkins again, the same person I thanked from the other day, because he provided some of these slides. And uh, another gentleman named David Smith that I used to work with at the Fryer Company basically prevented, presented you can just go to the last one, Shree just. Yeah, okay, cool. So again, I'd like to thank, well, some of the information comes from this book. This is a really good imaging processing handbook if you, or if you have a desire to look into this a little farther. Uh, David L. Smith was a gentleman I used to work with the Fryer Company. We went out of business, but he produced some of the slides for this talk. And then again, Simon Watkins, who is Definitely one of the top microscope people in the world. Uh, he's at the University of Pittsburgh. And like I said, I took his class about three years ago. Learned a lot from him, so i got to give him some credit for this, too. All right, so that's the end of that part of the lecture. Math. It's math. Okay. And when you see when we start doing some image analysis, it's basically people wrote algorithms you know, to, to work with the pictures, okay, to deal with the math, okay, things like that.